One way to get a grasp of what a book is about is of course to look at its table of contents. Now, some books may not have a very helpful table of contents, right? Maybe it's just chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, and so on. But the critique of pure reason has a very elaborate table of contents. If we look at it, we can see that Kant has set up the book according to a pretty complicated plan, but a plan that can tell us something about what the book is about, what we can expect to find in it, and how Kant is approaching his subject matter. So, in this video, I want to take a look at the table of contents. And if you haven't done so yet, this would be a very good moment to pause the video and take a good look at the table of contents yourself before you join me on an exploration of it. And let me say that if you are using the um, Guyer and Wood English translation in the Cambridge edition of the works of Immanuel Kant, the table of contents is at the rather inconvenient place of page 85 and further. Okay, so if you haven't looked at the table of contents yet, please do so now. And then having returned to me, let's check out the table of contents together. So what it starts out with is a series of introductory materials, really. Um, there's a motto and a dedication, uh, which aren't too important. Then we get through the prefaces. There's one for the first edition and one for the second edition. Uh, and then we get to the introductions. Again, one for the first edition and one for the second edition. So we can already see that in this preliminary material, Kant made some big changes for the second edition, big enough that the translators, um, and also uh, I would imagine most of the uh, extant German editions, have decided to not just give some variants because that would take up too much space, but to actually print two prefaces, print two introductions. Okay, so in the preface and in the introduction, Kant is going to set out what his project is all about, right? He's going to try to explain to us the point of the critique of pure reason. Um, we will find him introducing the notion of the Copernican revolution, like his Copernican revolution, uh, which will give us some food for thought. Uh, and we're going to find, especially in the, in the, in the introduction, um, we're going to find Kant's proposal that we should understand the book as being about the distinction between analytic and synthetic and a priori and a posteriori knowledge. And that, you know, his, his central question is going to be the question of whether synthetic knowledge a priori is possible and that this is sort of the question about the possibility and the limits of, of metaphysics. So when we look at the introduction as in the second edition, we are going to see um, titles of sections like on the difference between analytic and synthetic judgments and synthetic a priori judgments are contained as principles in all theoretical sciences of reason and so on and so forth. Okay, so that's the introductory material. And I mean, it really is introductory, right? It's Kant setting out the point of the project. And it's important, and we're going to spend definitely some time um, looking at it, but like the real argumentative structure of the thesis starts when we get to one transcendental doctrine of elements. Okay, so let's first look at how the book is structured at this level, right? Here we have something called one, maybe book one or part one or just big giant uh, Roman one, the transcendental doctrine of elements. And so we expect a two. And there is a two, but you have to look to the very end of the table of contents to find two, the transcendental doctrine of method. And if you take a brief look at the page numbers here, then you will see that the transcendental doctrine of elements starts in the Geyer Wood version, which I'll be using uh, here, uh, starts on page 153. And the transcendental doctrine of method starts about, well, almost 500 pages later, 627, and then goes on until the low 700s. So where the transcendental doctrine of elements is almost 500 pages long. The Transcendental Doctrine of Method is less than 100 pages long. 
So this is a very big discrepancy, right? There's a one and two here, but almost the entire book is the one, is this transcendental doctrine of elements. Okay, so let's first say something about the second, the two here, the transcendental doctrine of method. This in many ways reads a little bit like an appendix to the book. It's not strictly speaking an appendix and it's definitely not uninteresting. I mean, Kant is going to do quite a number of things here. He's going to explain to us in detail the difference between philosophy and mathematics. Uh, he is going to talk about, um, uh, he's, he's giving us methodological advice uh, about philosophy, about the use of reason. He's going to tell us about freedom of, of speech, really, freedom of speech. Um, he is going to try to paint a picture of like the bigger philosophical system that the critique of pure reason is supposed to be part of. And he is going to even briefly mention some historical considerations uh, about how his own thinking fits into, into the history of thought, really, uh, in the very last chapter called The History of Pure Reason. Uh, so there's a lot of fascinating topics here, but it's also kind of clear that this is not where the central line of argumentation lies. That is in the transcendental doctrine of elements. Okay, transcendental doctrine of elements. Well, transcendental is a word that we are going to be hearing a lot uh, when we talk about Kant. And one thing that really is important is to make a distinction which Kant doesn't always um, make carefully himself in the text, but at least we can try to carefully make the distinction between transcendental and transcendent. And so for Kant, transcendent means transcending the limits of possible experience, right? So a transcendent metaphysics is a metaphysics that goes beyond possible experience and talks about things like God and freedom and immortality uh, and stuff like that, that, that is just beyond our possibilities of experience, right? That we couldn't know through experience, but transcendent metaphysics believes that we can know it maybe through the use of pure reason alone. And that is something that Kant is going to criticize, right? So Kant is going to criticize a lot of transcendent stuff and instead argue that in a sense, we have to be imminent thinkers, that we have to stay within the limits of pure reason, which are also going to be the limits of possible experience. On the other hand, there is transcendental, right? And transcendental for Kant has to do with trying to understand the limits of reason. Right? It's precisely when reason embarks on a critique, it's precisely when reason uh, tries to think about its own limits, tries to think about what makes experience possible and so on and so forth, that we are in the realm of the transcendental. Right? So we're going to come back to that, but roughly transcendental is a word that is going to describe the kind of philosophy that Kant himself wants to be doing in the critique of pure reason. And of course, that's also why he ends up calling his own position here transcendental idealism, right? Transcendental idealism. It's the idealism that you get into once you do a critique of pure reason, once you start thinking about the nature of reason and how reason can know the world and what the limits of reason are. Okay, so the transcendental doctrine of elements. What are those elements? Well, we can think of those elements as being the elements of cognition. And in particular, Kant is going to be interested in, um, he's going to be interested in sensation or like the sensible stuff that has to do with, you know, our, our perception of the world. Um, that's going to be very important to him. And he's going to be interested in, in thought. He's going to be interested in several elements actually of thought. So in order to learn more about that, let's descend a level and check out what we find under the transcendental doctrine of elements. Well, there's a first part and a second part. The first part is again, very, very short um, compared to the second part, especially. The first part is the transcendental aesthetic, the transcendental aesthetic and then the second part is the transcendental logic. So aesthetic has nothing to do with 
at least here it has nothing to do in the critique of pure reason it generally has nothing to do um, with what we would tend to call the aesthetic or aesthetical or aesthetics right which has to do with beauty uh, or maybe with taste or maybe with art um, it's the study of beauty and, and art and that's what aesthetics is right that is not the way that Kant is using the word aesthetic here he is using it um, following an older usage as having to do with the senses right so the aesthetic is what has to do with sensation what, what has to do with the senses and so the transcendental aesthetic is going to be about the role of sensation and the nature of sensation or the role of the sensible uh, or the sensitive however we would like to to call it um in our cognition in our grasp of the world our understanding of the world and so on so it's going to be about how we perceive things and the major things that Kant is going to talk about are going to be space and time and already here in the transcendental aesthetic Kant is going to make some of the biggest claims of the entire critique including a first statement and defense of his transcendental idealism but he has a lot more to say under the uh, heading of transcendental logic and with transcendental logic we get to to thinking to conceptual thinking to reason in the broad sense of that word right reason in the broad sense of the word uh, all the kinds of conceptual thinking that we are interested in okay so the transcendental logic starts out with a, a couple of paragraphs on what a transcendental logic is and and what makes it different from logic in general um, and then we get to one more subdivision well there are actually even more subdivisions but a further subdivision this second part of the transcendental doctrine of elements is divided into two divisions right division one and division two division one is called the transcendental analytic and division two is called the transcendental dialectic so there's the analytic and the dialectic and when people talk about the critique of pure reason they often talk about its three most important parts three parts that people generally think of as the most important as being the aesthetic which we just talked about and then the analytic and the dialectic and roughly speaking we can say that these three parts have to do with three different cognitive faculties right Th three different um faculties that is that is like powers or s skills is maybe not the right word um that we have as human thinkers the aesthetic is about sensibility the analytic so division one transcendental analytic is about the understanding verstand um, and then division two the transcendental dialectic is about reason reason in the narrow sense and Kant's word here is vernunft so verstand and vernunft understanding and reason in the narrow sense and again sometimes Kant uses reason to talk about the understanding and reason um, but most of the time when I'll be using the term reason I'll be trying to talk about just the reason in the narrow sense that is the subject of the transcendental dialectic and so very roughly speaking again the understanding is our capacity to deal with concepts and to turn those to use those concepts in judgments so when we look at the understanding we're going to find concepts and we're going to find those concepts combined in a judgment in a claim right in something that we could express in a sentence and in fact when we look at the division of division one the transcendental analytic we are going to find that it consists of two books book one is the analytic of concepts and book two is the analytic of principles and the analytic of concepts is going to be about our a priori concepts the concepts that we have a priori and that we can know maybe that's the better way to say it that we can know a priori will apply to all experience 
And then in the analog of principles, we are going to find that there are some principles, some claims that we can know in advance will apply to, um, to experience in general. So for instance, in the analytic of concepts, we might find out that the concept of causation is going to be in our experience. And then in the analytic of principles, we are going to find out that the general statement that all events have a cause, right? That's a principle, that's a judgment. That is something that we express in a sentence is going to be true for all experience, a priori. So first the concepts and then the principles that we can build up from those con very concepts themselves. So in the analytic of concepts, we find two chapters. Uh, on the clue to the discovery of all pure concepts of the understanding and on the deduction of the pure concepts of the understanding. And so in On the Clue to the Discovery, um, you know, Kant is going to, to ease us into what the concepts are. And then the deduction is going to justify the application of those concepts to experience. And so this is uh, a very unusual use of the term deduction. Um, if you know it from, from, let's say, just logic class, where a deduction is just a particular kind of reasoning. Uh, Kant takes this term from a law, from a judicial talk of his time, and he means here proving the right to a certain claim. Um, so the deduction is going to be about showing that, yeah, the concepts that we find in our, in our judgments really do, we really are justified in believing that they will apply to experience, that, the, that they can be applied and have to apply to experience. And it's here in the deduction that we are going to find what might be the most difficult, um, but might also be the most important part of the entire critique of pure reason, which is the so-called transcendental deduction. The transcendental deduction of the pure concepts of the understanding. Um, and this is going to be a section that Kant completely rewrites for the second edition. And so there are actually two transcendental deductions, the A version and the B version. And gigantic books have been written about this relatively short part of the book. And we'll have to spend a lot of time trying to get to understand it, because this is definitely where a lot of the magic is happening. Although, having said that, there's also a lot of magic happening in Book 2, The Analytic of Principles, uh, in which we first have a very brief, but maybe also quite important chapter called On the Schematism of Pure Concepts of the Understanding, in which Kant worries about the relation between the concepts on the one hand and our intuitions of space and time on the other hand, and, and how, we, how we actually can apply one to the other. Um, but the bigger part by far here is chapter two, the system of all principles of pure understanding. And here Kant is going to work out the most central metaphysical, one could say the most central positive metaphysical claims, right? Why are we allowed to believe that every event has a cause, for instance? Um, what are the things that we are allowed to believe a priori about all experience? This what happens here in this chapter two of book two of division one of the second part of the transcendental doctrine of elements uh, is going to form the foundation really of our knowledge of the world, of our sciences and so on and so forth. And so we have these, um, this, these beautifully named and I mean, so much of this terminology is stuff that Kant just comes up with because he likes it. And that's one of the things I really, I really respect about him. Um, I mean, who wouldn't want to read about the axioms of intuition, the anticipations of perception, the analogies of experience, and the postulates of empirical thought? Um, everyone wants to read about that, right? And so of, of particular importance here in the analytic of principles um, are the analogies of experience, 
which are about substance and causation and interaction and, and what they have to do with space and time. Time especially is going to play a very important role there. Um, and the refutation of idealism uh, is talked about a lot when people try to understand Kant's transcendental idealism. Because that's kind of weird, right? There's transcendental idealism, which is Kant's position. And then here is a refutation of idealism. But of course, what he refutes is a different kind of idealism. The idealism, say, of a Barclay, which Kant, after publishing the first edition, had been accused of propagating. And this is Kant saying, no, no, my philosophy is like totally different. Right? It, it has nothing to do with the thought of someone like Barclay. Um, there's also a chapter on the distinction between phenomena and noumena that we will definitely want to come back to when we get there. But for now, let's move on to Division 2, the Transcendental Dialectic. So here we are going to talk about reason. Um, and this is often called the negative part of the critique. Right? If, the analytic of, if the Transcendental Analytic gives us our a priori concepts and a priori principles, then the Transcendental Dialectic is here to destroy the illusions of reason. Um, and to a certain extent, that is a fair description. Right? So what Kant is going to do, uh, especially here in, in Book 2, Book 1, again, is just a very short introduction. Um, in Book 2, the dialectical inferences of pure reason is Kant is going to take a giant sledgehammer to some of the most beloved metaphysical notions and proofs. There is Chapter 1, the paralogisms of pure reason. And again, we're going to find these paralogisms, antinomy, ideal. I mean, this is all just terminology that Kant himself comes up with. So if you haven't seen these, these terms anywhere else, okay, that's why. The paralogisms of pure reason are about the paradoxes and problems that reason comes into, um, or, or especially the, the false claims to knowledge that reason gets into when it tries to get a priori knowledge about our immortal soul, about the I. So Kant here is going to attack rational psychology. The idea that we can know something substantial about the I, about ourselves, from pure thought alone. Chapter 2, The Antinomy of Pure Reason, is about the application of reason to the notion of the world as a whole. And Kant is going to talk about questions like, um, is the world eternal in time or not? Is the world infinite in space or not? Um, what about causation? Are there infinite chains of causation? Or must there be some kind of first cause? These are the kind of questions that, that Kant's going to be very interested in. And what Kant is going to argue is that here reason gets into necessary self-contradictions. And this is actually going to form a, a second basis on which Kant argues for the truth of his own transcendental idealism. He's going to argue that reason can prove that the world must be finite in time, that it must have had a beginning in time, and that reason can prove that the world must be infinite in time, that it can't have had a beginning in time. And of course, that is a contradiction. But the proof only follows if we make certain mistaken, both of the proofs only follow if we make certain mistaken assumptions, in particular the assumption that the world as a whole could be an object of our knowledge. And Kant is going to show that that is just not the case. Uh, and so rational cosmology, like questions about whether the world is eternal or not, they fall by the wayside. We can't, we can't know anything about that. We can know neither that it is nor that it's not eternal in time. Uh, and finally, in chapter 3, the ideal of pure reason, Kant is going to talk about proofs for the existence of God. And here we are going to find his famous, um, his famous uh, counter-arguments uh, to the ontological proof. Uh, but he's going to take on all the proofs that he thinks are, are important enough to warrant a discussion. Okay, so that is sort of a, a negative story, right? Philosophy is wrong about this and wrong about that and wrong about that. 
But there's actually something more positive going on at the same time. Because Kant thinks, well, first of all, Kant thinks that we shouldn't just show that philosophy is wrong. We should also explain why it's wrong. Why we get into these illusions all the time. There's something very therapeutic, something a bit Wittgensteinian, maybe, uh, about Kant here in the dialectic. Although I guess the right thing to say is that there's something Kantian about Wittgenstein. So Kant is going to, to explain to us the nature of reason, reason in the narrow sense here, the nature of reason such that it can't help but get into these problems. And this has to do with the fact that reason always wants to go on. Right? Reason, given any event, wants to ask for a further cause, and then for a further cause, and then for a further cause. And that naturally leads it to a consideration of whether there's a first cause, or whether there's a cause of the totality of all events. Right? That is just natural. That's just part of the nature of reason. And in fact, the nature of it's very important that reason has that nature. Right? It's very important because it's only because reason always strives to transcend whatever limits it has so far found in empirical knowledge um, that we can do the kind of rational inquiry that we are, are in fact doing. And so it's going to turn out that the ideas, the ideas of the soul, the idea of the world, the idea of God, are going to play an important positive role in the Kantian system as well, basically as a kind of ideals, as long, and they can play this positive role, as long as we remember that they aren't objects of theoretical knowledge in the strict sense, right? Uh, we shouldn't fall into the trap of, you know, starting to argue whether the world is eternal or not, whether there's a, a necessary cause outside the universe, of the universe, or not, uh, and so on and so forth. And so probably in this course, depending on, on how the videos go, I'll pay less attention to the dialectic than to the analytic and the aesthetic. And this is, I'm, I'm basically just following the secondary literature there. But still, the dialectic is really interesting and we definitely want to, to take a look at it and find out what the most important um, developments of Kant's thought and Kant's system here are. It's really, in a sense, strange that the critique of pure reason only talks about reason once we get past the halfway point, right? Once we get into the dialectic. But, of course, here we have to remember that Kant uses reason also in a broad term, in which case almost all of the um, critique of pure reason is about reason, because then it also is about the understanding uh, and we'll see that there are some serious questions about whether the aesthetic, whether thinking about sensation can be wholly divorced from the understanding and therefore from reason either. Okay, I hope that this brief look, well brief, that this almost 30 minute look at the table of contents will help us navigate the critique of pure reason once we really start reading it.